Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira from UFMG and today I will tell you how to insert five functions in a program to convert it to SSA form. We shall use to this end the notion of dominance. If you remember from the class on loop optimization, node D dominates node N if every path from the beginning of the graph to N goes through D. And there is a very important property of SSA form programs. In a strict program in SSA form, the definition of a variable must dominate all its uses. A strict program is a program in which every variable is defined before being used. Notice that in this definition, if x is an argument of a phi function, then the definition of x dominates the edge from where that argument comes from, not the basic block where the phi function is. We can see that the dominance property is true in this program. If you want, you can stop the video and check that every definition dominates all its uses in the SSA form program. Again, notice that in the case of uses that are arguments of five functions, like for instance uh, the uses of a2, a1 and a3 in the definition of a4 here. In the case of uses that are arguments of five functions, the property is a bit different. For instance, variable a3 is used in the five function that defines a4 at uh, L6, where A3 is defined, does not dominate L8, where the Phi function is defined, but L6 dominates the edge L7 to L8. The important question, nevertheless, is how can we use this property to guide us in the placement of Phi functions? Well, something very lame that we could do is to add a Phi function at every basic block with multiple predecessors. Then if we do this, we can traverse the program's dominance tree, renaming variables to make sure that SSA property remains true. But we can do much better, actually. To pave the way for a nice algorithm to place Phi functions in the program, we need to define this notion of dominance frontier. First, Let's talk about strict dominance. A node X dominates another node W strictly if X dominates W and X is not in W. Now, dominance frontier of a node X is the set of all the nodes W such that X dominates a predecessor of W but does not dominate W strictly. As an example, try to find dominance frontier of node E in this example. That's a good moment to grab a piece of paper and stop the video to do this as an exercise and to make sure that you understand this notion of dominance frontier. So, to start with, node E dominates nodes F, G, H and E itself. From this set, it is to come out with the dominance frontier of E. Would you like to guess it? Here's the dominance frontier of A. In a way, the dominance frontier of a node is the set of vertices in the graph that the node almost dominates. So, for instance, E dominates F, which is a predecessor of D, but E does not dominate D. Therefore, D belongs into the dominance frontier of E. But why does E belong to its dominance frontier itself? Well, E dominates H, and H is a predecessor of E itself. However, E does not dominate itself strictly. Well, as a matter of fact, no node dominates itself strictly by definition. From this definition of dominance frontier, we have the following algorithm to insert five functions in the CFG. Whenever a basic block X contains a definition of some variable, let's call it A, then we need to insert five functions for A at every node in the dominance frontier of X. And because the insertion of these five functions produce new definitions of A, we need to iterate this procedure. 
Thus, we need to insert more phi functions in the dominance frontier of the dominance frontier of x. The set of nodes is called the iterated dominance frontier of x. Let's clarify these notions with an example. In this program, we have a definition of x at node f. Let's insert five functions for f, for x. First of all, what's the iterated dominance frontier of node f? Well, the dominance frontier of f includes nodes d and h here. And the dominance frontier of d includes l here. The dominance frontier of h includes l as well, but it also includes e. So we will need to insert five functions in all these nodes. I have marked them here in the bottom figure. But this process should not stop yet. Where's the dominance frontier of node E? This dominance frontier of E includes D and L, but it also includes node K down here. And the dominance frontier of K includes only node L. That has been already accounted for. So with all these nodes E, H, D, K, and L, the yellow set here. We are done with the places where we should insert five functions for variable x defined at node f. In other words, these nodes colored in yellow, they make up what we call the iterated dominance frontier of f. As always, we can compute the dominance frontier using equations. Well, computing is just a way to put it. The equations simply show what the dominance frontier is like. From these equations, one can build up an algorithm. In this equation, df of n is the dominance frontier of a node n. df local gives us the successors of n that n does not dominate. They are in the dominance frontier, of course. And df up gives us the dominance frontier of nodes dominated by n as long as n does not dominate these other nodes. Okay, I know that became a bit complicated to put in words, but let's look into an algorithm that computes the dominance frontier. I will not try to give you the details of the algorithm. I just, uh, I just suggest you to stop the video and try to find a relation between the equation here on the left side and the imperative algorithm on the right side of the figure. Once we have computed the dominance frontier of the nodes in the CFG, we can insert five functions. This algorithm that inserts five functions is on the left side of the slide. Again, we will not try to read it over, but notice that what's going on, uh, what the algorithm is doing is for each definition of a variable a in a base block n, it inserts five functions for a at every node in the iterated dominance frontier of n. Or in other words, in the dominance frontier of n, in the dominance frontier of the dominance frontier, and so on and so forth. Once we have inserted five functions for the variables, we must rename the variables in the program. The essence of this procedure is that we shall look into every variable defined in the program and then check every use of it that it dominates. Then we rename the definition, uh, rename the, the definition and dominated uses so that they will have the same name. The renaming procedure itself reuses that old algorithm that we saw in the beginning of the course to rename variables in basic blocks. We can see it on the right, just to revisit it. And, to rename, and the rename procedure itself, which invokes the routine for basic blocks that we saw before, is here. This algorithm works for the entire program. It navigates the program through its dominator tree. You can see this part here. So basically, we are traversing the program's domin uh, dominator tree and invoking the routine to rename variables within basic blocks. You can read the algorithm more carefully if you stop the video. We will continue with an example. So as an example, we shall convert this program on the left to on the, on the left to SSA form. You can see it's CFG on the right. 
This program has been taken from Appel's book, Modern Compiler Implementation in Java. We start by finding the dominance frontier of the nodes. For that, we need the dominator tree. The dominator tree is here on the right side of the figure. So, given the dominator tree, perhaps you want to stop the video and compute the dominance frontier of each node in the CFG. Here they are, the dominance frontiers. Now, let's insert five functions in the program. Do you remember how to do it? For each definition, insert five functions into the dominance frontier of the basic block that contains the definitions. You can see the program with five functions on the right. Can you make head or tails of this program? Perhaps you could stop the video again to see if you understand the succession of events that forced the insertion of these five functions. Let's see. The definition of i, j, and k at l0, l1, and l2 do not lead to five functions, for the dominance frontier of that basic block is empty. But then we have definitions of j and k at l5, l6, l7, and l8. What's the dominance frontier of the block at l5, l6? Stop the video and make sure that you understand that the dominance frontier contains l9. Then the dominance frontier of L9 contains L3. Again, we're talking about the iterated dominance frontier. And then we are done with the iterated dominance frontier of L5 and L6. Before we move on, could you think about these questions? I suggest you to stop the video and try to answer at least the first two. So for the first answer, we could, in principle, to have a five function with just one argument. Like in LVM, for instance, um, they exist. However, the algorithm that we are seeing here will never create them. About the second question, sure, we can have five functions with as many arguments as a basic block has predecessors. Now, can you rename the variables in this program? On the right side, we have the new program with variables renamed. Perhaps you would like to check that the SSA properties hold, that is, that definitions dominate all their uses. This algorithm that we have seen was published in 1989, and it computes something that's called minimal SSA form. This is not actually a good name. The algorithm can insert more five functions than necessary. For instance, Consider this program, where we will insert five functions for variable i. There is a definition of i right here at L2. We will have a five function for i at L1. However, this definition of i is not used anywhere. So this five function is pretty much useless. And yet, the algorithm will insert it, as L1 is in the dominance frontier of L2. So, how could we remove this kind of useless five functions? One thing that we can do is to use liveness analysis. If a variable is dead at a given program point, we do not have to insert a five function for it at that program point. This is a technique that was introduced by Preston Briggs uh, in the early 90s. And with this example, we close the discussion about how to convert a program to SSA form. Notice that we had seen a somehow outdated algorithm. There are newer ways to insert five functions, which are actually more efficient. For a discussion, see the references at the end of this class.